Okay. Are we on? Are we on? Okay. So, uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me now. Can I get someone to just type hello? I can hear you so that I'm looking. Great, fantastic. So, um, thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, very glad to be able to give this talk. Uh, and thanks very much to the wonderful people at Sensory Lab for inviting me. Uh, John, do you have a question now? Okay, great, great. So, um, I'll carry on. It's a slightly it's a slightly weird configuration giving a talk to a blank computer screen, but we'll see how this goes. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, fairly generally about a collection of the research that I have done and am doing at the moment. Uh, I put this together under the heading Human Machine Interagencies. Um, and really I'm interested in exploring the messy areas between people and technology. Um, I might turn the camera off for now, just uh, so we can see the slide. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a bit of context about myself and about my group. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the theoretical backgrounds that I draw on and the ideas I think are interesting. And then I'll go through about five different projects um, that are in this kind of area and that I think uh, um, have worthwhile findings coming out of them. Uh, so firstly, what's the context I work in? Um, I'm really between a few different disciplines. Um, I'm probably closest to human-computer interaction and this general sense of how do humans interact with computational systems. Uh, not so much in the micro-interfaces side of things, but the more uh, large-scale um, and uh, network side of human-computer interaction which starts to relate to what is now being called human data interaction. So how do we interact with the collection, use, and reinterpretation of data, which has a lot of questions around legibility and agency and negotiability. So how do we understand data? How do we give ourselves the power to act in data-driven systems? And how do we find spaces to negotiate what is and isn't okay around data? Um, I draw on ethnography a fair bit, so the the practice of understanding people through observation. Um, and I also draw a lot on research through design. So how do we use uh, design methods as a way to ask questions and as a way to understand possible futures? Um, so my core questions really are how do we tease apart these messy bits? Um, how do we understand interagencies? And I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by interagencies later. Um, and how do we develop a context um, and how do we bring that context into designing computational systems? So it's not just the technology, it's the way it fits into people's lives um, and the ways that they interact with that technology. Uh, and behind this all is a desire to say, how do we create the technological futures that we actually want to live in? Uh, so technology is changing. How do we make sure that um, us as researchers and the population at large is in a position to shape that technology to fit the kind of future that they would like to build. And this looks at things like ethics and acceptability, and also democratization, communication, and uh, public engagement around uh, technology and new ideas. Um, I, do, I can do this because I'm part of a fantastic research group back in Edinburgh called Design Informatics. Um, and we have a range of people from uh, designers, ethnographers, um, ethicists, medical HCI people. Um, we cover a very wide range of uh, backgrounds and questions, but the central idea is that we're looking at designing from, with, and by data. So how do we look at the flows of data and how do we make sure uh, that data and the systems it goes through sustains and enhances human values? So it's really looking at the network society we're in um, and uh, creating spaces for humanity in that. And this can take a lot of different forms. Some of it looks like uh, design practices that we're used to, so lots of soldering, lots of drawing, lots of constructing prototypes with all sorts of strange materials, uh, quite a lot of participatory workshops with Lego. Um, 
And so it might mean things like making Lego metaphors for blockchains as a way to understand uh, complex computational infrastructures. This is Chris Speed and Debbie Maxwell's uh, block exchange workshop. Uh, this is Louisa Pietzanella Talon's uh, Bit Barista, which is possibly the world's first Bitcoin powered coffee machine, uh, which will sit and negotiate with you about the supply chains behind the coffee and highlight some of those decisions that you're making every time you order a cup. And it might bargain with you and say, I'll give you a free espresso if you clean my drip tray. Uh, so, what happens when objects have a bit of agency in the world? Um, in a similar vein, this is another of Lewis's projects, which are hair dryers that will negotiate with you about when you can dry your hair. Uh, when they're connected to the smart grid, they know the price of energy. They can say, well, actually, if you wait 20 minutes to dry your hair, then uh, it's going to be much cheaper. So how do we uh, take these emerging infrastructures and put them into things that the public can experience? This is one of Bettina Nissen's pieces called Trustful. Uh, which looks at the idea that we have too many decisions to make about who we trust or don't trust with our data. So can we delegate some of that? So it's a quiz that asks, uh, when might you delegate decisions to um, your partner or your mum or your best friend or an AI about what can and can't be done with your personal data? A lot of it's quite physical. This is uh, my student Mark Williams um, creating a smart fabric chair cushion that can sense your bum print. Uh, and apart from the exciting transgressiveness of sitting people on it, getting them to look at the pretty dots and then explaining that this is their bum they're looking at, um, it lets us think through um, if you've got someone's bum print, then you can start to look at their posture and you can potentially look at their uh, emotional state. Uh, so suddenly you're asking, well, who actually gets to see that data and make inferences about it um, and who has control over that chair? Um, some of it is... Uh, quite low tech. So uh, these are data comics. It's work I'm doing with Ben Benjamin Bark and Zhejiang Wang. Um, how do we use graphic novel elements as a way to communicate complex data uh, to the public and engage them with it? And, I mean, this is something that we're seeing is very necessary at the moment. How do we get these tricky scientific concepts into a form uh, that people can understand? And sometimes this uh, ends up as physicalization. So this is the Wolves project. Uh, where each of these white boxes is connected to a data source, so the blue feather wiggles every time a Just Eat bike is returned uh, to the docking station. So it gives us a way uh, where all sorts of people can prototype interactions with streams of data, uh, and they can do it in a fun and playful way, and they can do it by making bells jingle and feathers wiggle and all sorts of very direct at-hand stuff. So it, it helps make... Um, it helps make these abstract things much more tangible and present. So a lot of this comes through research through design. Uh, so design is not just a way to make better stuff. It's also a method for generating knowledge because you make the stuff and you see how people react. And then that tells you not just about how to make the things better, but about how people relate to things. And that helps you understand some of their needs and desires um, and how to deal with them in the future. Um, I work a lot with mess. I think mess is really important. Um, when you come from a computer science background, there's a tendency to want to formalize everything, but actually the world is messy. Um, and finding ways where we can include that mess in the things that we build uh, means that we catch lots of things we'd otherwise miss out on and we get some of the textures um, and the intricacies of life coming through into systems. I'm very interested in thingness. Um, so the idea that the stuff around us is not just inanimate matter. Um, it shapes the things around it. It shapes the ways that we behave. Um, and uh, even quite inert stuff has a lot of power in the world. Uh, and this leads into really the sense of interagency. So as we make things, uh, as uh, as we uh, create stuff, that changes the way we are, and it changes um, the things that we make, change us just as we change them. So we get these interagencies and uh, constellations of effects and cause and effect um, between people, things, and algorithms. Um, Andrew, you asked about uh, lots of typing. I'm not typing at all, so if there is typing, 
uh, someone has their mic on, it would be great if they could turn it off. Thanks. Um, and this leads on to a sense of entanglement. So we don't just relate to the things around us, we're quite dependent on them. Um, so we have these codependencies where the things around us need us in order to survive. Um, and we also need the things around us to survive. Uh, so we're not looking just at individual people or individual objects. We're looking at the constellations and the networks uh, of those things. Taken together, I like to put this under the heading human algorithm interaction. Um, it's quite a broad idea. And what I'm really trying to do is map out um, socio-technical systems and look across different scales and different focuses. Uh, so human computer interaction was typically quite small scale. How do we interact with interfaces? It's much broader now. Um, and it started as being quite technological, but now has a much larger social dimension. But then other areas like human data interaction tends to look at larger scales and sits between the technological and social or data ethics uh, can be even larger scale again, um, but possibly more social than technological. And I do this with uh, quite a few different projects, and that's what I'm going to start talking through now. I'm not going to do all of these projects uh, because there is nowhere near time. Um, I'm going to pick a few of these, five of them, uh, and go through them one by one. So I'll start with um, a bit of a research area that's built over a few years around design and personal data. Um, and this comes, it's really grounded in social machines, which comes out of uh, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, very early work on um, what the web is and uh, what it should be. And he had the, he very much had the idea that the web was supposed to create new forms of social process and that it would uh, help the social development of the whole world. Whether we believe that or not is, uh, very much an open question. Um, but one of the things that's come out of uh, interaction going online is that all of our interactions are data. Um, and because they're data somewhere, that means that they can be reused and reinterpreted indefinitely. And one of the side effects of that is that you never quite know who you're speaking to. So when you use Facebook, uh, for example, you may be intending to speak to your friends you might have a slightly loose idea of who actually gets to see that. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of shadowy figures that you might not expect to see that or wouldn't have done five years ago of advertisers, of data miners, of insurance companies, uh, potential landlords, surveillance companies. Um, and this is what Helen Nissenbaum calls uh, violations of contextual integrity. So you say something in one place with some expectations about how it's used, and then you suddenly find out that you've been refused a house because your landlord has uh, looked at your Facebook postings and decided that you're not very trustworthy. Um, that's a real example of a company in the UK that was doing exactly that as its core business. I think they're shut down now, uh, thankfully. Um, and so to kind of to get into some of this stuff, uh, one of the design approaches is to look at the edges of things, to look at the strange behaviors. Uh, so we went out and we started asking people about why they lie online, because lying is often seen as socially deviant, but at the same time, it's something that a lot of people do a little bit here and there to smooth things over. So we have the idea of white lies. Um, and so we asked people about why it is that they lie online. And you get a lot of the things you might expect, but you get some really interesting responses back too. So um, people pretend that there are other genders to try and understand uh, how uh, how that gender experiences the world. Um, Elliot, is this better now? I'm, I'm holding my microphone to stop it hitting things. Okay, great, right. I'll try and I'll try and keep that one very still then. Um, and we also see people doing things like role-playing as members of hate groups. Um, so they can get a, a window into their psychology. 
And when you go and talk to people about this, you find that there's a lot of very creative reasons that people have for lying. Um, and this hasn't been missed by the design community. Uh, there's also a, a question about how we use deception within design and how it can sometimes be useful. So we've all seen um, the placebo buttons in lifts that don't actually do anything, but they make us feel like they're doing something and it makes us feel like we have control over that situation. Uh, so drawing on this um, a few years back with Max Van Cleek and Amy Guy and a couple of others, uh, we started looking at, could we make tools that enlist our devices to lie on our behalf? Um, so we made a whole suite of uh, imaginary tools. Uh, there's the, the version of moves that lies about your location. It might pretend that um, when you're actually in the pub, you're in the vegan cafe next door, so that if your insurer is spying on you, um, it looks like you're living a healthy lifestyle, um, or it might just fuzz your location a bit so that you can use location-based services, but you're not giving away the exact uh, place where you are, or a calendar that lies on your behalf and it fills up your entire diary with fake meetings that look like your real ones uh, so that no one can book you unless you say, well, I'm sorry, my calendar made a mistake. I do actually have a free slot then. Um, and by doing this, we found you know, design fictions are a very quick way to get into uh, interesting behaviors. Uh, people really don't like the idea that they lie, even though they know they do it. So if you give someone a button that says, I want to lie, uh, it's quite a psychological step to press it, um, even if it's a behavior they would do naturally. And they don't like the idea of uh, having a history of lies. On the other hand, they're very happy to lie to platforms like Facebook and uh, to systems that they don't trust. Um, and this leads to ideas like deception by default. So if, if we fill uh, all of the output of systems with fake information and we only reveal the true information when we really want to, um, we can kind of, we can regain a bit of space for human uh, behavior within this kind of slightly surveilled society we find ourselves in. Um, so that's a slightly playful end. The more serious side of this is a more recent project where we were looking at digital phenotyping. So just as uh, phenotypes come from uh, genotypes, your digital phenotype uh, says something about your internal states by looking at um, the online traces that you leave. Uh, and this uh, came out through some large scale studies, things like looking at location uh, traces from smartphones and inferring when people were having depressive episodes. So you can learn a huge amount about uh, quite intimate states from fairly publicly shared data. And we did a study with a collection of students um, where they ran this kind of self-tracking uh, or this data gathering app so we could talk to them about the process. And they, you find things like they turn up saying, well, I don't care if you know about my uh, battery level. But then when you explain to them that actually you can see when it was discharging overnight, and that means we can pretty much guess that they didn't make it home that night and maybe they got lucky and stayed out. Um, by demonstrating the inferences that people can make, um, they had much... Uh, a much better basis to make decisions about what data they were happy to share and when. And so this led into adopting or, or translating um, a framework for medical interventions called the Theoretical Framework for Acceptability into looking at digital interventions. So there's about seven aspects, I've only got five of them here, um, to look at whether systems are acceptable to people or not. Um, so students in the context of mental health were very worried about what their lecturers and tutors might find out about them. And they were a lot worried about the loss of autonomy and dignity uh, that comes with that. Now, if you can find me a lecturer who actually has the time to go through and look at the behavioral logs of all their students, well, I've got some marking that they could do for me. Um, but it, it also says that, you know, we need to be, when we're designing systems that collect data, we have to be transparent about what data is collected collected and who has access. And we have to find a way to communicate that to users in a way that makes sense. Um, they're also very concerned about things like coherence. So if they don't see the relation between some data you're collecting and the target you have of increasing their well-being, then they're going to be reluctant to share that data. And that means not just explaining why the data is being collected, but explaining how you interpret it 
um, and developing a sense of uh, consent that is about the inferences you make, not just the raw data on its own. Um, so altogether, this if we're looking at being able to collect data at a large scale in a human-friendly way, uh, we'll get much better data if people are engaged with it. We know that people are happy to lie to systems that they distrust. So it's very useful to bring in acceptability as a lens for looking at um, barriers to adoption and the things that might cause people to mistrust our systems. Um, and we can use design approaches to make more acceptable data collection, which should give us better data that helps us make better decisions. So that's project number one. Uh, project number two is called Chatty Factories. Um, this is a collaborative project between about five universities, Cardiff, Edinburgh, Lancaster, uh, Essex, and Nottingham. And it's looking at how we, um, how we might think about manufacturing stuff in the future. Uh, so rather than the idea that the designer knows exactly what a product should be and you put that out into the world, um, because it's now relatively easy to put sensors into objects, we can look at the way that things are actually used in practice. So we can collect this uh, in the wild uh, usage data and use that to develop design insight, which is then fed into the factory for rapid manufacturing changes. Um, and we can really close the loop between um, ideas of what things should be and actually making stuff that lives up to that. Uh, so it's um, medium scale and it sits somewhere between the social and technological end of things. Um, my part in this is developing a sense of digital ethnography. So how do we make sense of uh, sensor data in a way that tells us something useful? Uh, so our first study was with a collection of smart speakers. These are Bluetooth speakers, but they also have an accelerometer in um, that gives their orientation and a sense of how much they're being moved around. Um, and they stream that and data about how they're, using, they're being used back to a researcher somewhere else. So we get this remote view of what's happening to this object. And this means um, that we can start asking people what's happening at interesting moments. So if we see something in the data traces that we don't quite expect, it gives us a moment where we can contact them on WhatsApp and say, hey, can you take a photo of what's going on? Or can you take a video? Or can you tell me about what's happening? And the reason that we want to do this is I don't want to put cameras inside objects that go into people's houses. That's horribly creepy and invasive. If instead we can enlist the participants to help capture and make sense of the data, then it means we can get these little glimpses into life. We can get some quite rich context about what's going on. We can see the way that things are being used and the way that they fit into the stuff around them. Um, but we're not really doing surveillance and we're in a position to ask the participants uh, to explain what's happening. And it means we find things like, uh, this photo came out of seeing some quite strange data traces and we asked the participant what was going on and they said, well, uh, this uh, spherical speaker that you've designed is absolutely terrible because it rolls off my uh, kitchen surfaces. Uh, so they had wedged it behind their kettle and that's why um, we saw it rolling and falling off and then getting a bit warmer for a while. Uh, so the, the data gives us a way to develop windows into people's lives with their participation. And we get to see things like the speaker on the left has been annotated with the gestural commands it has. Um, they can tell us about the times when things have gone horribly wrong or when they've, or we get to see that they've kind of made these objects a bit their own and decorated them. Um, and we can build up these quite rich pictures where we put together um, text and mobile conversations with photos, with data traces, and we can then start to label it up. And this gives us a great um, possibility for doing machine learning over this data and developing you know, good, a good sense of what activities people do um, and being able to train models to spot those things and to spot new things around them. Uh, so this really showed us that having conversations at the right time is crucial. Um, because by the end of the day, someone's probably forgotten what was going on in that interesting interaction. And we, we've seen this come through a few times in the data. People didn't mention stuff in the debrief um, at the end of the experiment. 
which we did manage to catch um, through the data and through the photos and through the conversations. Uh, so, and we also get a sense that we can enlist things to help us understand people. Uh, so by putting objects around people, um, they're more sources for data collection, they're more sources for interaction. Um, and uh, I mean, th this relates to the idea of thing ethnography by Elisa Giacardi and Chris Speed. Um, but we can find ways to do this. Um, and if we collect data about the object rather than the people, then there's ways to start making this data collection informative, but without being too invasive. And this leads into what I'm calling entangled ethnography. Uh, so it's using sensors in the object and data collection um, to capture data, then carrying out some kind of machine learning so you can do it at scale and uh, some kind of visualization and analysis so that we can make this data uh, usable by ethnographers who are not always data scientists. And they're then in a position to have conversations with the participants to help interpret the data. Um, they can work with the algorithms um, to do some assisted sense making. So as they start to label up the data, um, it can tell them what the bits they've missed are or where interesting things might be. Um, and then it can start to generate conversational prompts. So when something interesting happens, uh, they can they can write at that moment, say, hey, what's going on? And it's a very quick route to spotting new and exciting behaviors. And really what we're trying to do here is balance a desire for detailed information uh, against a fear of surveillance, um, finding ways to use data as powerfully as possible, but without being reductive and thinking that the data tells the whole story without having a human explanation around it. Um, and it's also, um, accepting a bit of disruption in exchange for insight. So more traditional ethnography, we really wouldn't want to be disrupting people's lives because we want a sense of how they are naturally. Um, in this way of working, we're trying to bring participants in so they collaborate on the ethnography, uh, because to me, that's the way to, to work with uh, long-term data about people's lives um, in a compassionate and open way. It also means that we're looking not just at the interactions between the person and the object, but the whole constellation that includes the designers and the um, of various types and the process, the fabrication, the supply chain, um, the ethnographic process around that uh, potentially links to other people um, and the algorithms and data that mediate all of this stuff. Uh, so it, it's trying to develop really a constellation view of how people and objects interact that should support giving us design insight about things. We've also been taking this to designers. So um, if Kai wasn't canceled, we'd be presenting a paper about uh, data-driven product design where we did workshops with design experts where they would annotate objects with uh, questions about them and the kinds of data that might help answer them um, as a way to start developing uh, future design practices and utopias. We find fairly quickly that um, designers are very used to the idea that um, data will help them optimize things, uh, but not the idea that it might help them spot new things that they might want to do or generate ideas for new kinds of products. Um, so there's, there's quite an interesting area where we can develop new participatory, um, quite open data-driven design practices that engage people um, and by engaging people, it helps make sure that what we're doing is ethical because otherwise people will get annoyed and won't want to take part. So that was uh, Chatty Factories. Um, I hope I have time to go through a couple more of these. Um, Geopact is a very live project at the moment, and it's looking at the idea of blockchains. So blockchains are complex um, crypto technical systems. Um, they're relatively large scale. And to really make sense of them, you need to understand the cryptographic technology as well as the social implications and the economics and the incentives and stuff around them. So they're quite strange things. They've been massively hyped. Um, and lots of people think they're the answer to everything when they're really probably not. Um, and one of the issues around it is that 
they can mean very different things. So it can start from a simple kind of cryptocurrency idea where you're exchanging digital value, um, as people often do with Bitcoin. Um, and it can go through things where you start programming smart contracts that allow you to make promises uh, with some degree of trust and um, all the way up to the slightly more um, wacky end of things where people are saying, well, actually, we can replace all of our laws with smart contracts and we can create a distributed autonomous society that is entirely governed by code. Um, so actually grappling with all of the things that sit around this technology is really difficult. Um, and so that's why uh, we do things like make workshops where we manifest ideas in Lego. So this is a block exchange where people are um, making transactions, writing them on Lego blocks. And uh, in the corner, someone's doing countdown puzzles uh, to pretend to be a Bitcoin miner. And every so often there'll be a new level uh, stuck on this pile of blocks that represents a block on the blockchain. Uh, so it physicalizes some of the metaphors, but it also gets people to think that actually the whole thing is a way to exchange value. It's not just cryptocurrency. What might we be using it for? This led on to a project called GeoCoin, um, where we made a geolocated currency. So we can start to design possible futures and say, well, what if you could only spend money in certain places? Or what if you... Um, could be automatically given money for going somewhere or money could be automatically deducted for being in places, much like, you know, automatic tolls nowadays. Um, so we had this on a phone app that people could use and they would move around the city and they'd go through the green zones that give them money and the red zones that take it away. Um, if you're the first person to one of the black spots, then you get a bunch of money. Um, and this was a very open-ended workshop. It's what we call unfinished infrastructure. So we gave them this system, um, but it was then very much up to the participants to interpret what was going on and tell stories about it. And based on this, we then got them to ideate what they might do with systems like this. And we saw some really interesting responses like uh, rethinking um, what marriage might be and having a, a three-week marriage where you have a wallet where you can only spend money when the two of you are together or thinking about participatory budgeting, where by being in certain places, you're contributing to the idea that, yes, there should be a play park here, um, or you can drop suggestions for bits of physical infrastructure that could be built. But by actually creating this as a, as a simple software system that works, you run up very quickly against uh, things like people with newer phones, their location updates quicker and they get more money out of using this system. So you see the edges of the infrastructure and some of the inequalities coming through quite quickly. Uh, you also realize that when you do a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, it's about 10 minutes before it's on the blockchain and another 10 minutes before you can really believe it. That's one of the idiosyncrasies of the system. So we started having to show people their their real balance and what their balance might be if everything goes to plan. So you start to see um, the funny bits around the edges of the infrastructures and you manifest them to people so they can start understanding them and working with them. This has all led on to the Geopack project, which is taking the idea of um, networked IoT devices that know where they are and saying, supposing instead of having all of these competing companies that were doing things. Maybe we can have uh, some smart contract based things where you can negotiate with the devices themselves. Um, and we can have an ecosystem of uh, kind of intelligent objects that know where they are. And you can make agreements with them about different things. Uh, so when I say smart contracts, really what are smart contracts? They're kind of digital promises and conditions. They look just like um, a programming language. It's written in a custom language, Solidity, or there's a few other options. Um, a lot of them are of the form, if some condition, then some action. Um, but and the, the special thing really is that they're distributed and they're transparent. So everyone can see exactly what happens in a smart contract. So you can check it's doing what you think it should be doing. Um, and you can see who's participating. Uh, 
um, and you have a certainty that everyone is going to agree that when the program's gotten to a, st a certain state, that's the state it's gotten to. So they give you some level of trust in the operation um, of the program that someone's written. Uh, and if we look at stuff that's happened on the blockchain, there's lots of work done around what the actions should be. So there's lots of stuff about if these things happen, then transfer bitcoins or change ownership or all sorts of uh, effects in the network. But it's much harder to get the conditions in because blockchains are formal systems. They're not connected to the world. Um, so what we're interested in is supposing we can bring location in here and we can have conditions like if the train is a bit late, then I want a partial refund. Or if it's very late, then I want a full refund. Um, so it, if we could do some of these things, uh, it would mean that rather than having to go back to the train company and ask for refunds, it would happen automatically. Um, and also we could have more flexible ideas about tickets. So it's not necessarily this train and that train, um, but it's a general contract to get from one place to another using whatever collection of transport is appropriate. Um, but we're very keen that these should be things that people can create because that changes the dynamics. And so part of this was talking to people about what's important to them about location. Um, and it turns out that you know location is not just a position on the map. It has a lot to do with who you're with or the kinds of places you are. It has a lot to do with time. If you're going to see a festival, um, then it matters not just that you're in that field, but you're in that field at that particular point in time. Uh, what's the effort to be there? What's the uh, restrictions around being there? And so through a whole bunch of design workshops, we could come up with a library of things within smart contracts where we could in code ideas about things like being co-located with people um, so that we could write them up into smart contracts and we could say things like if i'm co-located with someone else then do something we embedded these into smart objects so these are our first generation of smart boxes um, and this means we can do things like write a smart contract that says um, i'm going to be a courier i'm going to collect all of the bits to assemble a car. Some of them have complex security around them. Uh, some of them don't, but I'm going to do this in a way where I'm paid for each delivery and I'm paid at the end and it's absolutely verifiable what I've done. But I don't have to go through a company like Deliveroo uh, to prove that. So the boxes give people instructions. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of physical handovers where Boxes being next to each other means that they will open up and you can transfer goods between them, or there's a physical verification that people do to say an exchange has happened. They can be attached to smart transport. We can uh, show people the state of the system. We can show them what needs to happen next in the contract. And also on the right here, um, what is being written to the blockchain as this goes on. Um, and this means that we can go into public and talk about these quite abstract computational architectures in a way that makes sense to people. And we can uh, keep a sense of surprise by filling some of the boxes full of chocolate. Um, so by doing this, we, we get to the point where people can really notice uh, what happens when you bring a physical infrastructure and a digital one together. And they can say, how does it know it's allowed to do that? Why can I do this now and not? in five minutes, what happens if something goes wrong? And all of those very useful questions you have to ask um, about systems if you wanted to actually live with them. And it also means we can have possibly the youngest person ever to participate in a smart contract. Um, and I think if I had to sum up the key message of this, it's that democratization only works if you build understanding. Uh, so we can only make this stuff work by helping the public to understand what's going on. If we want the idea that people can start to have a hand in creating uh, the systems that they work within, then we have to help them to understand what those systems are and what they might be um, in order for them to have you know, a fair shot at um, shaping their future direction. I'm gonna do one, one more project, I think. Um, I'll see if I have time to do another one after it. Um, let me know how you feel about timing and ending on time. Uh, I can see whatever you type. 
this one is called Lichtsuchende, uh, which is German for the light seekers, because uh, if you name things in German, then it's clearly high art. Uh, it's a collaborative project with Rothio von Jungenfeld, and um, it's quite small scale and sits between technological and social, really. Um, and it's really looking at how people and robots, uh, well, it's it started as a creative art project, and now it has a lot to do with how people and robots interact. So let's see if I can um, play a video on here. Maybe not. Let's try this one. Okay. Oh. Okay, hopefully that comes through. Um, the Lichtzuhende is a small society of, of robot sunflowers. Um, so they're they're small static robots. They can turn um, their top parts, um, and what they do is they track light. Uh, so they'll always turn and orient themselves towards the brightest light coming in. Um, and they, this means that we can send people in there with torches, and they can go and interact with them and make friends with these slightly funny robot creatures. Um, it's quite a playful thing. It started as an art project, um, and they gradually developed more and more of a sense of their identity, and they became a slightly networked uh, society um, with the idea that they would start to communicate by exchanging light with each other. And we see all sorts of fun behaviors pop up where um, the little groups of them will start exchanging actions and interactions. Um, when people go and interfere, they start setting off cascades of slightly emergent behavior going on. Um, I'm finding it very hard to talk over a video, which uh, here is kind of stopping and starting and pausing. Um, and so as, as an art piece, they're great fun. Um, they started out very much as an exploration. So I'll see if I can play this very first video of where they came from. Um, Oh, I seem to have uh, broken the software. Let's try this one. OK, so yes, sir. right. So I had no idea these things were going to end up the way they did. Um, it started from just playing with a few light sensors, a bit of uh, strip board, two servo motors and an Arduino, and lots of toothpicks and glue. Uh, but very quickly, um, once these bits came together, uh, they developed a real sense of kind of being a bit animate, of being a little bit alive, of having a sense of curiosity and nervousness. Um, and even though I knew it was very much uh, just a a little bit of code. I couldn't help reading it with a bit of uh, emotional weight. Um, so, and that really intrigued me. I, I knew that it was uh, a very simplistic digital system, but I responded to it emotionally. Um, and so we started thinking, you know, how do we develop that and how do we start exploring that? Another key moment happened uh, in this video when we had several of these things together. Um, and we found this slightly surprising thing. Um, if I skip forward a bit. We'll see if this works. Um, but we, when, we, when we brought two of these uh, robots near to each other, they would start to go into this very uh, strange jerky dance and it really felt like a territorial thing, like they were saying, no, you're too close, back away, back away. So it read quite defensively. 
Uh, yes, very much uh, anatovitz. Um, in the longer talk, I have some photos of his stuff in here as well. Um, and so, again, I know that this is really just a digital algorithm overshooting and going back. It's like when you walk down a corridor and someone's coming towards you on the same side, uh, you both step to one side and then step back again um, as you try and negotiate a way to go forwards. Um, but it, it still reads um, as, uh, you know, th this is a behavior and there's intention behind it. So if the slides work again, so that this led us to go back and go, right, we've got, we've got these things. Um, how do we help put all of these behaviors together into a way that makes sense? And uh, we draw on kind of Maslow and his hierarchy of needs um, and developed a set of states that they go through because you also find that if it's just tracking light, then it has personality for about 30 seconds and then it becomes boring because you know what it's doing and it becomes a very clear stimulus response. Um, so by helping, by putting a bit more of a complex internal state in, they suddenly feel a lot more anima. And this is what means that when we have lots of them together, um, we can see changes in behavior. We can see activity sweep across the society and lots of interesting things that make it a slightly more compelling piece for people to interact with. Um, to me, one of the interesting bits was we spent a long time saying, oh, no, we're not really designing them. Um, we're just helping them be what they want to be. Um, and then over time and some slightly more critical reflection, we realized that that's not really actually quite true. Um, there's bits where we're very clearly, as designers, as creators, imposing our will on them. Um, and then there's other bits where we're very much kind of looking at the emergent behaviors that come out and finding ways to support them and noticing what's going on. And one of the tricky things here is to do this, but without getting too anthropomorphic, without having a sense of, you know, oh, they want to do this. Um, because in a lot of ways, they don't want. Um, but that's the way that we would talk about it. And that's the way that we would read it. Um, and the thing that kind of helped us make a bit of sense of this was bringing in the idea of imaginaries. So what are the social patterns that they're uh, following and um, the ways that they're able to relate to each other in the world? And this helped us to sort of think into what it is to be one of them, but without going too far of uh, in anthropomorphizing them or imputing too much uh, human-like qualities to them. Uh, and although this is in the context of a creative project, it's quite useful if you're thinking about designing network systems to have a picture of how they see the world, what their umwelt is, what their kind of biosemiotic relations to things are, uh, because that helps you understand the ways in which it might go wrong or the ways in which it might be not doing what you hoped it was going to do. And this is also leading into some work at the moment where we uh, filmed lots of people interacting with them. Um, with cameras on the people, with cameras on the torches, and with some cameras on the robots so we could see what they were seeing and what they were looking at. Um, and this is starting to help us understand what are the physical metaphors that people use when they interact with unfamiliar robots. So it starts leading into thinking about how we might design robots in the future. Um, yes, I, I think I've covered all of those things. Um, so the next bit I would talk about, and I'm going to skip over a little bit, is called experiential AI. And to some extent, this is bringing a lot of these ideas together and saying, how can we use creative practice uh, to articulate what's happening inside AI systems? Um, this is one of my favorite examples of this. Um, it's a piece by Jake Elwes called Machine Learning Porn. Um, he's taken the, I think it's the Yahoo content filter that tries to spot pornographic images, turned it inside out and got it to generate images instead. Um, and it's well worth searching for this and watching it because it, it generates these videos that are uh, kind of almost pornographic but never quite resolve into anything. Um, but it gives you a very 
clear sense that when you've built a filter system based on real data, that real data is embedded inside it somewhere. If you talk about support vector machines in machine learning, all of those support vectors are people, if it's one that you've built on people. So all of these complex algorithms end up in embedding the things that they look for somewhere along the way. Um, let me see if I can play you this just because it's a nice video. Um, this is another of his pieces called ZZ, uh, if it appears. No, that's not going. Okay. Um, I'll show you it later. But the, the general idea is that rather than just looking at algorithms and humans and their interactions, we can broaden this out to look at um, the way that data is collected that's fed into the algorithms, the machine learning researchers that work on them, the way that uh, algorithms are commissioned and the power that they have to make decisions, who gets to have a say in their deployment. So when we're looking at um, AI and we're asking about fairness and transparency and all those things that we need to to make sure they're doing the right things, it's not just the algorithm, it's the whole context that it's embedded in that's important, going even all the way out to the computation that makes it work, the environmental impacts, um, and the theory behind it, and the imaginaries there. But one quick thing, because I know that there's uh, some uh, artists and people with artistic practice uh, in the audience. Why do we want to get artists entangled in all this kind of stuff? Why do we want to bring artists in to help us make sense of what's happening in AI and related fields? Um, and my favorite writing on this goes back to uh, Bourne and Barry and their logics of interdisciplinarity. So when you do interdisciplinary work, it can be about um, breaking the barriers between science and society and making science accountable. It can be about finding new and interesting things at the intersections of the domains. But to me, the really powerful thing is when creative practice helps us shift the way that we see and understand things. So just as um, turning a content filter into inside out makes us see that algorithms are actually embedding um, exactly the things that they're looking for inside them, um, creative practice can help us shift the way that we're thinking about stuff inside our disciplines. So I'll wrap up there. Uh, we've had a bit of a look at human algorithm interaction through a few projects around personal data, around uh, intelligent objects and entangled ethnography, around some blockchain infrastructures, some um, light-seeking robots, and we've skimmed a lot of the creative practice and experiential AI. Um, but I think my key messages are, you know, technology is moving fast. Let's try and make it fit for humans and make the kinds of technological futures that we really want to live in. And to me, this means engaging with mess and with uh, thingness and interagency and the constellations and entanglements and networks and stuff around us. Um, I think experience is really important, both for helping publics to understand things. So all of the things that we do where we can bring people in to engage with uh, funny computational systems in different ways help to create public understanding of things, but it also helps us as practitioners to understand the kinds of systems we need to be designing for people. And so this kind of creative practice has a role in both public understanding and uh, changing the ways practitioners think about things. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, it's probably easiest to do questions if you have some by typing them, and I can keep going until um, the presentation software kicks us all out. So any questions? Thanks for listening.